we've, we've worked out the best thing is for me to be up here and also uh, we had an IT failure and I was going to do a nice sexy thing with a clicker <coughs> but I did a talk last night with a different computer so the clicker is with the wrong computer. Um, <coughs> yes, well as, um, as Colin said, uh, I'm, I'm in the process of a very protracted, uh, gentle leaving formal employment with Reaction Engines and starting up a company which I can hardly deny is me. Um, and I'm going to come to the reasons for that towards the end of the talk. What it does mean is that I know people on nasaspaceflight.com have got lots of burning questions about the details of what's going on at Reaction Engines. I can no longer speak for Reaction Engines. I'm no longer a director. I have resigned my directorship. And in any case, a lot of these are very confidential. So you can ask as many questions as you like. I will just go stonewall and will not answer them uh, because I'm not in a position to answer them. Also, strictly speaking now, I can't really speak for the future of Skylon since I'm sort of drifting off that project. Uh, and anyway, having sort of, I was pressed by Mary, you know, I've got to have a title for this talk. And knowing roughly what I was going to say, I said, well, it's about the future. The future of Skylon will do. On reflection, I really should have called it the future with Skylon, because what I really want to look at this evening is Skylon's impact on astronautics generally. What will it mean when it comes into service? Um, and also some of the issues that are related to that. So uh, it's, it is what was in the abstract, but it might not be quite what you would expect from the title. I'm also going to expect, uh, accept that you guys pretty much know what Skylon is. It's not going to be a this is Skylon. Um, OK, we'll just have the reminder for those of you who know but just can't quite remember. Um, it's a space plane. It takes off from a runway, powers into orbit, and I mean orbit, not just a Virgin Galactic up down, then can return uh, from orbit and do a runway landing, a gliding runway landing like the space shuttle but all in one go, all in one stage. The reason it can do this is those engines, which of course are what reaction engines are about, the Sabre engines that enable it to breathe air when it's in the atmosphere all the way up to Mach 5, about 25, 26 kilometers. It's not a fixed altitude because it sort of wobbles around a bit while it's doing the transitioning. Uh, and the real thing about this, and it's difficult to get across um, the feeling inside the project, if you like, to, to what's outside, is, is achingly close to being realised. Uh, and the, the reason we are at that point is because we've had some real geniuses, particularly Alan Bond, but we should also mention Richard Varville, who's put an awful lot of the, the engineering into this. Um, we've uh, Reaction Engines has got an extraordinary dedicated workforce. It's a real privilege to work with people who are that dedicated to the job. It's, I've never been in a place like it. They're all highly talented and they all work like crazy and achieving great things. And the other thing we must not forget is no bucks, no buck rogers. We've had spectacular angel financing of the talk, you know, you, you, you know the rules on angel financing. You can't get more than 100,000. We've had about 10 million. Um, you can't get money for technology. We've blown it all on technology development, uh, but it has brought us to an absolutely unique point in, in astronautical history. When the vehicle gets going, what we will have is something that can put 15 tons into low Earth orbit um, in a payload bay that is 4.8 meters diameter. <coughs> That's just a little bit bigger than the um, current sort of standard size. Um, you've still got a lot of length, 13 meters, but actually the, the logic there is we're trying to get payloads to squash up a bit because uh, we have a trim problem and if we make payloads too long, the CFG moves too much. So we're, we're trying to give the incentive to payloads to squish themselves up a bit. While on the payload, we, we're making a lot of efforts to simplify the interface, to make it that the <coughs> payload really can just do its own thing, get built, turn up, pop itself into the payload bay and get flown. Because at the moment what happens is that the um, payload and the launch vehicle interact and that has to be analysed. So there's a whole bundle of joint analysis of the structure and the way the two work together 
and it costs a few million. Now, if the launch cost is in the order of 100 million or even a few tens of millions, a little million for analysis is not really much of an issue. But if Skylon gets down to the level we hope it will, that sort of million is starting to really impact your ability to lower the cost further. So we're trying to make it that if we can fulfill our goals on cost, um, we're not um, messed up by having created something that has got a legacy of too much overemphasis on analysis before launch. And of course, cost is what you first think of as the advantage. The point of making something that is reusable is that it is going to make things a lot cheaper in getting into space. And we all know that the cost of reaching space is fundamentally what is holding back astronautics at the moment. The problem in the short term is it might not be uh, quite as low as you might uh, have wished for. What we expect is that when it comes into operation, the price that the operators of Skylon will charge will be a little bit below the best that you can currently get. So it will be the cheapest way into orbit, but maybe not by that much. The big difference is that at that price, the whole thing is economic. The person operating the launch vehicle gets his money back with some profit. The person who built Skylon and developed it, he gets his money back with profit. The person making the spaceport gets their money back with profit. So the big difference is not the price that the user is paying, it's that the price the user is paying is now covering the cost of the launch instead of being about half the cost of the launch and the taxpayer paying the other half. So there's a big fundamental change going on in terms of making space economic even if there isn't that much change in the price. In the longer term, we would expect it to go down. This 10 million we keep uh, have been banning around for years now, and yes, we know about inflation, but I think we're also finding ways where Skylon might actually be cheaper than we originally thought. So I, it's a very rough number, but in the long term, we could still be looking at $10 million for a launch. When you actually talk to people who look like they might be using Skylon, the first surprise is this actually doesn't bother them too much. Yes, they'd like it cheaper. And yes, if it's the cheapest, it'll be the one they use. But you've got to remember at the moment when people launch satellites, they've already got an economic model that works with the price they're currently paying. Their problem is that they spend 300 million buying their satellite, another 100 million for the launch, and then they play Russian roulette. There's a one in 50, one in 60 chance that the payload is going to end up at the bottom of the Atlantic or the Pacific or somewhere where they don't want it, not in space. And then the problem is they've got to make a new satellite, a new launcher has to be made. So it's years before you can then get your thing into operation, even if you're covered by insurance. So it completely messes up your business plan. So every time you get to that launch point, the current people who are investing hundreds of millions in, in business plans are taking a 1 in 50, 1 in 60 risk because of the launch vehicle. So they're far more interested in a more reliable system. Now, on entry into service, the test flight program will have proven that Skylon can do better than a 1 in 100 chance of mission success. But the big difference is here is that if you have an abort, you get it back. <coughs> the actual chances of losing the satellite are something more like 1 in 20,000 proven uh, by the test flight program. What the real reliability numbers are is very difficult to say. It'll come out uh, when we build the thing and operate it, and it will change as people get more experienced. It will get more and more reliable as little sort of bugs and things are sorted out. So in the long term, we would probably see levels that are approaching aircraft levels. It's never going to be civil airliner levels of reliability, but it will be something that would probably be quite easily certifiable for uh, public um, flights and, and safe enough for that. The other thing that, again, is more important to people in the industry uh, than you might imagine is the availability, because at the moment, it is actually quite a constraint to have to wait and plan your launches three years in advance while you get put in the production line and be made. With Skylon, it's going to be sitting in the hangar, and so even at the start, you should be able to get a launch within a few months' notice. And if you wanted to, and if you set your operation up right, 
you could probably launch a Skylon uh, in just a few hours. From a few hours of a decision is we want that in orbit, a few hours later, it's in orbit. So overall, what we're doing is we're seeing Skylon is something that can move, getting into space closer, not all the way, but a lot closer to the way we currently think of air travel. Now, you'll see I keep coming up with this sort of short-term, long-term thing, and that actually is enshrined in the requirement spec that has objectives to be achieved when it's in service and objectives to be achieved in mature operation. And that sort of dual look actually ends up when you feed people thinking about Skylon, once they've accepted it might be real, they then have sort of two views on how it might be. You have people in the short term, the people in the current business, the people who cannot see space changing from what it is now. They launch communication satellites and a bit of human space flight and a few science satellites and the like. And what they do, yes, they're still very excited by Skylon because it will be a faster, cheaper, better way of launching communication satellites and a bit of human space flight and the old science satellite. There's another group of people who say, well, hang on a second, this is, this is disruptive technology. This is a game changer. This is going to change absolutely everything. Um, we're not going to do things the same. We're going to open up a huge new era of exploitation and exploration. We're going to start realizing the vision of how space and humans in space is going to be that was really how we thought about it in the 1950s and the 1960s. And people tend to fall into one camp or the other. They don't see uh, a link between them. You're either someone who thinks, oh yeah, I'm going to launch my communication satellite cheaper and better, or I'm going to start conquering the universe. So which one is right? Are they both right? Um, is one right? Are they both wrong? Let's start by looking at the short term. Here's a picture that will warm the cockles of the heart of any short-termer. Skylon launching a geostationary communication satellite with a reusable upper stage. Um, the reusable upper stage you're seeing here is uh, an REL design, uh, and the key point is that it uh, when it's finished its mission, it actually can come back and redock with the Skylon that launched it and be brought back by the Skylon that actually launched it in the first place.